Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. This is Salman. Uh, I am a principal group engineering manager at Microsoft. And uh, today we're going to be doing a session uh, hosted by Pat Launch on uh, trying to show how you can use satellite imagery uh, using Microsoft's binary computer and do analysis on it to help identify and classify areas that are flooded. Uh, the goal really uh, is to really give back a bit to the, to the community uh, that has been providing um, uh, to the relief organizations in general have been working together through this crowd, crowdsource platform, um, uh, the Yushahidi platform and the Park Flood uh, uh, program. It has been a great uh, initiative. I really want to commend everyone for that. And we, I would want to just briefly show that as well. And uh, one of the things that we were doing at Microsoft was trying to find a way to give back uh, to the Pakistani community and find ways to help uh, the relief organizations in uh, prioritizing prioritizing relief work, and that platform provided the private APIs that allowed us to get a sense of where all the relief centers are, where are the medical medical camps, uh, where is where they might be damages, etc. And um, I'm going to do a quick demo of that platform, and I would encourage uh, you all to kind of uh, learn about that, try it out as well. It's it's really cool, and then uh, I will be handing it off to Anna to talk about. Um, uh, how, as more of a workshop, a bit, a bit more hands-on of, you know, how you can do analysis of satellite imagery and how you can obtain satellite imagery in the first place. Um, so with that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen very quickly. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, do you all see my screen? Yes. All right, great. So this here is the floodlight application. Um, and uh, I'll be sharing some of the URLs and stuff. Uh, you can also get, get this through the Park Floods website. And it is a really, uh, really great initiative uh, by several folks that have worked on this. Um, uh, in particular, I wanted to give a call out to Mubasar Hayat, who has been really instrumental in helping introduce me to this platform and the details of it from the, from the API perspective. And what you see here is uh, a map of Pakistan. Um, and you're seeing various locations uh, that have certain areas, like flooded areas, for example. This might An area that's flooded, and you can click on the UK. Oh, yeah, so um, and they have different views of the data to really understand um, all the different points of interest in Pakistan with respect to relief efforts. So uh, what's great, and, and but they have an app where you can enter data. It's crowdsourced, uh, etc., which is which is great. I'll, I'll share some links on this as well. But in particular, what I was interested in as somebody living in, in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley and, and really trying to build uh, you know, a hackathon uh, around uh, trying to find ways to help Pakistan relief, relief efforts was that they have an absolutely amazing set of APIs here. Um, and so uh, here's the API documentation. I'll share a link of that later as well. But everything you kind of see here is driven by uh, this API. And the API is, uh, is part of this platform called Yushahili. Um, there was a great session yesterday that really explained more about its its origins, but its origins were part of I think uh, they were doing some elections for Kenya, and and then they uh, allowed this platform to kind of be open for the world to use. So uh, it is really thorough. Um, uh, in in this case, the APIs that are being used are are really simple to use. I I did want to quickly show you that as well. What we did with these APIs is that. Uh, we wanted to add value at Microsoft with our hackathon by trying to take this data and visualize it in a 3D metaverse-like environment. Uh, so we had uh, basically a model of Earth uh, in 3D. Uh, and um, in particular for Pakistan, it's unique geography. You have the highest mountains in the world um, and waters and the glaciers have been melting over there. And that goes all the way down through to the ocean and this entire area here. Uh, you know, you'll, you know, we want to see what the impact of flooding really was. It's, and so we built a tool. Unfortunately, I'm not able to demonstrate that. Um, uh, I don't have the permission to demonstrate that, but I did want to find other ways to give back where we're going to do a training session today 
uh, uh, from Anna on you know how you can use satellite imagery. A, how do you get relatively recent satellite imagery? Uh, uh, in this case, uh, I believe most of it will be free. What we're showing today, and then you know how you can do a before after analysis to identify uh, areas where flooding has been impacted. Uh, and we could, I know that I see that we have another GIS engineer from our team, Travis. Um, so we do have a lot of knowledge on the team here that, so I would encourage you all to ask questions. Uh, for example, you know, you know, how you can get building data, let's say, and you can correlate building data with flooding data to identify, you know, individual buildings, et cetera, that perhaps may have been destroyed. Obviously the road network, uh, you know, how you can uh, identify where uh, flooding has impacted the road network, and then um, you can imagine you can use that information to do stuff like uh, routing for logistics or uh, prioritization of relief efforts, you know, where is the most damage, etc. Uh, and so, um, so we will be able to hopefully show you some of that today as well. So with that, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to also, I had a request, uh, I just wanted to quickly show you some of the, AP, the actual APIs that, you know, I played around with. Um, here are some of the APIs. Again, the, the platform will kind of show you more, but uh, one of the ones I want to highlight was this forms API. Uh, if you, um, again, I'll, put, I'll post some links in there, but in general, if you kind of send a request in, it's just a simple curl get command. Um, if you just do curl and type this in, it'll work. Uh, there's no authentication etc. right now. Um, and what this will give you is that the list of categories. So relief camps, for example, relief needed, Everything that you saw up here, these sections here are in this. And then the ID here is the form ID. And you can then uh, pass into this post API. So the post API will give you all these pins, basically. And if you want to just get, let's say, the relief camps, for example, then you can pass in to the post API form equals one, like this. Um, and you just get a release centers in that. This pagination, et cetera, as well. And so you may have to use some of the, uh, you know, offset and pages. All of that is really well documented in this platform. Uh, so here's an example uh, where, you know, the post API, I saw the, you know, form, uh, I was able to apply form equals one or two, uh, where form represents a category, as I mentioned, and that way we can filter it down. It gets really sophisticated in terms of the kinds of things you can do. For example, you can specify, I want to give all, I get all the points of locations within a certain radius of a certain location, and we then leverage that API actually uh, to reduce the amount of data that we're having to work with as part of the hackathon. Uh, and um, in this platform as well, uh, that is captured, that type of filtering is captured via AI as well, uh, via um, uh, this UX as well. So for example, if you click up here, um, there's, you have a pretty nice UX way of specifying uh, filters, including the location thing I mentioned. So a lot of the stuff that you see here is backed up by APIs that I would encourage you to use. One thing uh, before I hand over Anna, I would want to mention is that uh, please do explore this, especially if you're living in Pakistan. Uh, if you're entrepreneurial, you think about how you can help uh, Pakistan's relief efforts. I do feel that this is a very powerful foundation for you to be able to find ways of creating impact, simulating uh, different situations, uh, and and you know identifying you know prioritizing work. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I'd love to hand it over to Anna. We'll be taking questions near the end, and I'm happy to answer questions about this. And Anna can also answer questions about GIS. We also have Travis on the call. So we have some really, really talented GIS people. So please feel free to uh, you know, engage and ask wherever you need. All right, with that, uh, Anna. Thank you so much, Salman. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Give me just one second to, to organize myself. Okay, how does that look? Excellent. So um, my name is Anna. I um, work with Salman and Travis at Microsoft. I'm gonna talk today about um, spatial analysis for flood, flood relief, how we get data, some basic analytics we can do on that data um, to prioritize response to disaster. So just a little bit about me. I've been working over six years at Microsoft on geospatial products. And more broadly, for around eight years, I've been working in GIS. Um, in my spare time, I really like to do um, work like this. Uh, with disaster response, I've done work uh, on communications response after Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria uh, in the Caribbean, as well as food bank uh, distribution in my own home. So uh, I always 
look for opportunities where we can use GIS to help solve real problems because that's what GIS is all about. Now, if you don't know what GIS is, that's okay. We're gonna start from the beginning. Um, Geographic Information Systems is what that stands for. Some people also uh, use the same acronym, Geographic Information Science. Basically, this is the system and science um, around capturing geographic information, storing it, displaying it, and analyzing it. So um, you're all probably familiar with this through you know, Bing Maps, Google Maps, our navigation apps. This is all kind of an example of, of GIS. And what we're going to talk about specifically, you know, after the flooding that took place in Pakistan, um, the GIS is one of many tools that can address um, information needs that arise after a disaster. So this is not only about flooding, but the same tools can be applied to um, conflicts, to other natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, et cetera. My goal today, I have a few, um, but I hope to empower you with some of the data and tools that can be used in this space. And I'm not an expert in disaster relief specifically, but I am an expert in geospatial. So, um, happy to sort of explore that with you today. We're going to talk about a few things. Um, first of all, geospatial thinking. I just want to introduce those of you who are not familiar with the field um, that we can all benefit from this type of thinking. Um, it is just a tool to real world problem problems, and um, we do not all need to be experts in order to use them. When we go deeper, I want to share with you excellent sources of geospatial data. Uh, they are all free and they are some of my favorite resources. So Microsoft's planetary computer is one. Uh, and then there's also a few other sources I'll talk about. And we'll just do a quick sort of talk about how we can use that data to address needs after an event like a flood or any other event. We won't be able to go very deeply, but I just want to sort of bring awareness to these kinds of methods. So how we approach a geospatial problem, I've broken it down like this. We need to know the problem we're solving. So for example, that can be how to um, select a location for a relief camp or how to route supplies from one place for another. That's an example of a type of problem that takes place in space, it's a geospatial problem. We need to find data that can help us get towards the answer. There's usually a step in processing the data, of course, analyzing it, actually designing a method to answer it for us. And most important, I think, is to communicate it, whether it's through a map or an action, what do you do once you know uh, the answer to your question? And we're going to focus really on these middle pieces. Where do we find data and what are some ways we can start to process and analyze them? So we'll start with the data piece. Quick guide to geospatial data resources. I'm going to talk about two types of data, remotely sensed and vector data. So when I talk about remotely sensed data today, I'm talking about satellite imagery and aerial imagery. And you guys have all seen this, I'm sure. Um, this is satellite imagery taken before and after the flooding um, near this city, Paroa. And um, again, very familiar. We all know what this looks like. And this is one of the most powerful tools we have in GIS because uh, we can see what is actually happening on the Earth at a given time. There are a lot of organizations who, who have satellites that generate this data. You might be familiar with some here. There are many, many more that are not on the screen. But generally, we can break them down into a few categories. We have government organizations who provide this data and capture it, at the least. Um, and then we have commercial data. Now, 
there are pros and cons to both. In the case of government source data, uh, it depends on the government, of course, but there's often free sources available and very long running programs. Uh, we have satellite imagery that goes back to the 80s. Uh, that's public. Um, there's actually some prior to that as well. And um, it is publicly available, though it's at a lower resolution, typically. Commercially sourced data tends to be better depending on the use case. It can be very high resolution, like less than a centimeter resolution. They also provide the ability to task satellites. So you can pay these companies to point their satellite at a location and take photos for you. Obviously it's very, very expensive, um, but many of these companies like Maxar, Airbus, Planet, they actually have, they provide this data for free if it's for humanitarian purposes or if it's in response to a specific event. So that includes the flooding in Pakistan, that includes Hurricane Ivan, which is happening in the United States right now, et cetera. Um, so it's always worth asking these companies what they're willing to provide because they have programs in place to work with the community on sort of specific problems. So a lot of data is out there. A lot of organizations are out there. How do you decide how to actually, what you actually need? I'm gonna draw our attention to two very popular data sources that can do a lot for us. And they come from these two organizations, NASA and the European Space Agency. They each have their own program. And it looks like this. Um, there's the Sentinel program from Europe, and there's the Landsat program from the United States. And these are satellites in space that take photos um, every five to 16 days at resolutions of 10 meter if it's Sentinel, 30 meter if it's Landsat. So, and it's free. So what this means is you can find a picture of almost anywhere on earth that is at most two weeks old you can compare it to photos of years and months prior. And um, like I said, it's free. Now the resolution, we consider that kind of low or mid resolution, but it is good enough to identify buildings. It's good enough to look at coastlines or water lines. It's good enough to identify roads. So for a course picture, this is very, very good. Um, now there are clouds in these data. We can't control that. Um, and there's vegetation that covers the ground. We can't control that either, um, but still quite good. And this is just examples of what those data look like. Now there's one more piece of space-borne remotely sensed data I wanna talk about, and that's synthetic aperture radar. So those images we were looking at are like an image you would take with your camera. It's true color, it's what we see with our eyes. Um, but there are also sensors that use radar. And the advantage of using radar is that it goes through clouds and it goes through vegetation and we actually just get a look at the earth. And not only that, um, depending on what bands you look at from that backscatter, uh, we actually can detect wet places. We can detect uh, surface water. So for this reason, SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, is a very good tool to assess flooding. And I'll just show you what this looks like. This is not true color. This is not what we see with our eyes, but rather what we see when we look at different bands and color them. But um, the pink areas are showing some surface water. And I'll just show you another example. Again, this is obviously not true color, but these are two images, one from before the flood, one from after the flood. Um, and you can see there's sort of a dark blue area. That is surface water. You don't see it on the left side, but you see more of it on the right side. This is what SAR data can do for us. And we can use this plus the true color optical imagery to kind of put together a picture of what has happened or what the earth looks like at a particular time. So with that said, I wanna introduce how you find this. And this is where Planetary Computer comes in. Planetary Computer is a product at Microsoft and they have this charter. They wanna support sustainable decision-making 
with the power of the cloud. Practically speaking, what they've done is they've assembled all of this earth data into a catalog and they, uh, they manage the ingestion, the color balancing, the organization and the hosting of the data. And then they provide us with a very easy to use catalog, which we can query, um, as well as some Python uh, environments where we can pull that data. So um, it's an amazing source. I'll actually show you really quickly what that looks like. But if you go to the Planetary Computer website, there is a place where you can sign up for their preview. Um, you'll just form, fill out a little form and then uh, you have access to their hub, what it's called. And a hub is basically a Python notebook environment. They support a few other environments and it will load up and you'll have access to all of these tutorials where you can query the data, you can find images with clouds or without clouds in this area or that area. You can really refine those queries and it's all Python based so you can write any tools or use any existing libraries to work on that data. Really, really powerful uh, if you know Python. And I'll just, I'm gonna just share actual planetary computers website with you really quickly um, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. It's very cool. So um, this is the site here. You can look at the data catalog, all of the data that they offer. It's not all satellite imagery. There's a lot here about vegetation or elevation Etc. And um, I'll just go to Sentinel here. You can explore the data and actually choose what you want to look at. So I'm going to go somewhere in Pakistan. We'll go down south here near Karachi. And we can control. Um, there we go. So this imagery, you can see this came from a few days ago. There's clouds. Um, but what's really cool here is that you can filter and query the data. So you can look um, at specific dates uh, going back deep into the past or not so deep. You can go just a month ago, let's say the month of July. And you can see in this case that was monsoon season so we have a lot of clouds in these images um, but point being you can query them very very easily and sort of um, access the data and every piece of data say you find an image that you're interested in um, you know it's all linked to the hub where you ha uh, have examples of how to download the data or how to process it in the Python notebook environment. So really, really cool program that we have at Microsoft. Um, please, I encourage you to check it out. I use it all the time. Now, sorry. That's remotely sensed data. I'll talk about one more type of data that is really important, vector data. Vector data is what we represent as points, lines, and polygons. So that is things like houses, um, stores, hospitals, building footprints, parks. Now we're talking about polygons. Lines can be um, used to represent roads or railroads, let's say. So this kind of data really enhances the satellite imagery. We don't see, we can see these things in the imagery, but we don't know what they are. And that's what vector data does for us is it tells us what other uh, data exists in that space. So most important for vector data is always a local source. So it's people on the ground who know best their communities. And that's why um, that's why floodlight is so important. This is crowdsourced data, a lot of it, that comes from people on the ground. This is always better than uh, these big free public data sets because they're often more relevant to the location, more recent, um, 
and actually describe what people uh, find important. So local sources of data are most important. Find the people in your community who are collecting data, who are aggregating the data and work with them. That's always the best source. Um, there are other sources that are not as good, but are pretty reliable and can give you a good start. OpenStreetMap is one example. OpenStreetMap is kind of like the Wikipedia of mapping. It is crowdsourced information. And on there, you can find a lot of data, um, hospitals, roads, schools, parks, uh, all of that. Now, it's not always complete, and it's not consistent everywhere in the world, but it's a very, very good start. And there are lots of places to get OSM data. My favorite is this website here, which is called Geofabric. And there you can go and pick your location and they offer a nightly build of OSM and you can just pull the data that you're looking for in a variety of formats. One more thing I'll mention is building footprints. Microsoft actually has a really interesting program around building footprints um, that is going on through Bing. And what the Bing Maps group does is they run AI on satellite imagery and they have a model to de detect the building footprints and they make all of that data available. So it is on GitHub by region um, and a lot of it is actually contributed to OSM. So sometimes you can get it through there. Now, we don't know necessarily what these buildings are. Uh, we just know that they are a building on the ground. This can be really good for quantifying impact of an event. So we can see how many structures are impacted. We can infer how many people live in an area, things of that nature. So building footprints are super important as well. Now, I'm going to move forward to some of the analytics pieces. We talked about data. You can find it um, on planetary computer or OSM or through local organizations. But um, now you we need to do something, right? And this is sort of where the fun begins, you could say. Um, there are lots of common information needs, especially after a significant event. Visualization is perhaps the biggest one. Just having a place where people can see all of the most recent information or information related to a specific event is huge. Um, and that doesn't come from nowhere. It takes people making those visualizations, making those resources so that everyone knows the, the most recent information, right? For flooding, there are some methods to identify flooded areas. And once we have flooded areas identified, we can look, we can do a lot of things. We can see how those areas change over time. We can quantify the impact and say uh, how much damage has been done and to who. And lastly, this data can dr drive decision-making, right? So if we wanna know, where to place sites or how to give resources to those who need it the most or those who are impacted the most, then we now have some basis to work with. I will just go through one exercise where we'll identify flooded areas. And um, this, I think, is sort of step one to start doing the other types of analysis. We want to know or at least guess where where a flood has happened. So um, common tools, there are more than what's listed here, but we have ArcGIS Pro. That's what I will use um, to show you this because it's very visual, but Python works, QGIS, which is an open source software works. There are lots of tools out there. And once you're in these software or once you're in Python, there are a whole bunch of libraries and tools to support. This is just a small subset of the tools that are available for looking at satellite imagery in ArcGIS Pro. Python has equivalents. You can always write your own. 
Um, it's just to say there are so many tools now that we can use to approach our problems. So if we use the flooded area example, I'm gonna just walk through sort of how I would do it quickly um, so that I can move on to higher order problems like what, how to give food or resources or whatever needs to be done. So I'm gonna talk about this one use case where we take that synthetic aperture radar data and we clean it up a little bit and what we're left with is a shape that describes the flooded areas. Okay, so SAR data, we got it. We have it from Planetary Computer. And um, problem is it can be very noisy and I'll show you what I mean. So what we're gonna do, we'll do a majority filter where you take lonely pixels in the image and if they're surrounded by a different value of pixel, then we change it to that value. So that reduces some of those um, noisy pixels in the image. Then we'll do a threshold where we decide which pixels correspond to the flooded areas, which do not. And we'll basically make it binary. We'll say, this corresponds to the flood and this does not. And we'll just sort of reclassify those pixels. And then last, we take that image data from a raster form to a vector form, a polygon. And we'll have a shape that describes the flooded area and from there, we can do a lot of other analyses uh, against other vector data. So we can say, how many buildings are inside this area? What roads touch this area? Um, does this area prevent access between two other places? Things like that. So we'll just start with this area here. This is near, um, this is near Tonsa Sharif. And I'll have that written on the slide here. This is an image before the flood and an image after the flood. And I just want you to sort of pay attention to how it changes. So this is before, you can see a lot of green space and you can see after there's a lot of brown and that, that corresponds to newly flooded areas. When we take the SAR imagery, it looks like this, okay? so. Again, I'll flip back and forth. You'll see that the pinks, the gray, kind of roughly corresponds to the brown in the true color. This is what has been detected as surface water. But you can see it's very noisy, like it just has grain all over the image. So what we do is we run a majority filter. And I did it through ArcGIS, but you could do it in Python. Um, and what that does is it takes those lonely pixels and kind of blends them with the surrounding pixels. And I, I realize the color changed, but hopefully you can see that a lot of the dots in the river area, um, now they're all black, meaning that they've been sort of erased and merged into this larger body. So these are all just steps to reduce noise, right? Next, we do a threshold. And again, the color changes, but basically here I'm saying, uh, all the black is water, I think. And I figured out what those values are and turned them green. And lastly, we're gonna take all those green areas and turn them into a polygon. So this is the same data, it's just represented a little differently. If it's not green, it's been taken out of the image. There's been some smoothing around the edges. And now we're left with this shape that um, is not perfect. It's not telling us exactly what's flooded. There's error involved here, but we have a pretty good place to start, right? And we have some, we are able to start quantifying this event and this change to the landscape. And I'll just show you what this looks like. This is the real image, how you would see it from an airplane or from a satellite. And then this is the same image with just all of the flooded areas extracted to the best of our ability. Now there's very sophisticated ways to do this. Um, this is not a sophisticated way, but it works very, very well. And we're able to sort of move on to the next challenge, right? So if I overlay this now with vector data, we can start to really enrich the scene. I added roads here 
And this is the town of Tansa Sharif, you can see in the corner there. Um, now we can see actually how this flood is impacting the region, right? So just a few things that I see, there's some flooded areas actually in the habitable area, like in town. There are some bridges. Oh, I actually see one I didn't circle. Um, some bridges, this is the Indus Highway and um, you know a lot of flooding over the road. So perhaps that's a place where access is, is compromised. Regardless, now we have uh, a way to sort of start to ask those questions. Is access compromised between different places? Which towns are impacted the most? You can imagine if we do this for more areas, if we do this for the whole country, now we have a very, very good look at this situation that's occurred and we can target communities that need the most help, those that have been impacted the most, either they have the most flooding or perhaps they have the least resources to handle you know, the, the consequences of the flooding. So um, hope, hopefully you can sort of see, see the idea here. Um, now that we have the flooded areas, we have a really good basis for nearly any other type of analysis that we want to do. And we can't cover them all. That's actually all, all I have to share related to this right now. Um, I really just hope that you're empowered with, with the geospatial thinking, the tools that are out there and the data that can be used. Um, we applied it briefly to a flooding scenario, which is very um, timely, but it's really this way of thinking that allows us to respond to any type of event that happens in our communities. So we'll just conclude there are excellent sources of geospatial data if you know where to look. Many of them are free and Planetary Computer um, is one of those sources for satellite imagery, SAR data, other types of environment data. And uh, we also have sources like OpenStreetMap and local data that comes from your communities and people on the ground who are uh, dealing with specific problems. There are rudimentary spatial analyses that can be done. We looked at how to identify flooded areas relatively quickly, um, but from there, you can go to deeper uh, response planning and you can make apps to communicate those, those decisions, those actions, those results. Um, and lastly, you don't need to be an expert in this. These tools are accessible to everybody and simple analyses and simple data can actually go a really long way if you're applying it to, to some sort of real world problem. So no matter what your background is, I hope that um, this put a bug in your brain and you can sort of see um, that this is really approachable if, uh, if you want it to be. So with that, I've sort of done my piece here and we have time for questions. And we have Salman and Travis in the room too, who can answer a lot of them as well. Great, thank you so much, Anna. This was a uh, really, really great. Um, uh, uh, you know, I must have learned a lot actually, so that was awesome. Thanks, thank, thank you so much. Uh, so with that, um, and by the way, Anna, if you have any links or something you wanna share, you can just kind of put them in the chat here as well. I also share those as well. So with that, we are uh, opening it up to questions. Please, uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, send them to Ali, who, who will then put them, uh, Ali Fahad from Pop Lunch, who will then put them here uh, so to share with Anna. And questions could be about this. They could also be about the um, uh, the platform as well, the APIs for, from the user ID platform as well. Uh, and I'm happy to answer those things as well. So great. Great stuff, great presentation. Uh, so let's see, um, I'll start reading through some of the questions from the top that I see in the chat here from Ali, um, who in turn get it from others. So one question, and I guess some of this may be partly answered already, and so uh, you can maybe do a quick answer and move on. Uh, but can this data be analyzed to identify roads, rails, and other infrastructure over time? Yes, absolutely. So the roads piece is pretty easy. Um, there are actually a lot of models that exist that you can apply to, to detect bare, um, bare roads. And um, there's some tools, like one is called Maximum Likelihood Classifier, 
It is a pixel-based classifier where um, you identify roads from an image, and then um, based on those samples, similar uh, pixels are identified in, 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 in an image. So that's a very nice way to look for roads. Um, it's a process very similar to, to what we saw today. Now, railroad may be a little more difficult. It's not as pronounced in satellite imagery, but there are other uh, methods that are more object-based where you can sort of look for a certain texture uh, in an image and identify those areas. So all of that is doable with roads being sort of the easier side, railroads being difficult, power lines being even more difficult. Those would require maybe better imagery, but um, the method is very much the same. That's a great question. Great. Um, the next one seems to be more of a comment here, perhaps a uh, sour false color uh, uses short wave near infrared, um, infra short wave infrared, near infrared and red light to help identify water beyond their natural waterways, which can be represented as a strong blue color. Yep, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. Is it possible to or mud houses using the tools made available by, by my Yes. So um, what you could do, you could write a process with Python or um, in ArcGIS, they also have a tool, um, an ArcPy library that connects to their tooling. What you could do is you could um, go through each building, searching it, and if uh, looking at the pixels in that image, and if a majority match the colors that you've identified prior, like a range of pixel values, then you can quickly iterate through all of those buildings, all of the imagery um, associated with those buildings, and select the ones that match uh, the right color of the, the, the mud homes. Now there's, that's not going to be perfect, but that's, that's sort of the simplest way I would approach it. And I think that the results would be pretty good or at least a good enough start. Great. Um, will the models tools trained on international data sets work for classification of crops, uh, crops in Pakistan? Um, yes, so th there are models out there for vegetation detection and identification. The problem is that um, our results are usually much better if we have some local data to validate against. So those global models are very, very good, of course. Um, but what I would encourage you to do if this was a problem that you're working on um, is see if you can get some local data that's that's labeled and do some training on that data just to really make sure that it is applicable to the landscape in Pakistan. So those international data sets are great, a great place to start. Uh, some more local data will always make that analysis stronger. So I, I recommend trying to kind of grow your own solution if you can, or at least combine the methods. Great, uh, thank you. Um, another question I have is, are you using a speckle filter? What is the threshold you are using to calculate the before after difference? Yep. Um, so no, this is more of a more of a smoothing filter, really, um, the one that I called majority filter. Um, uh, there are other types of filters out there that actually, you know, would have similar results. So you can you can select many different kinds. Um, the second question, oh, what is the threshold? So um, I given the bands um, that were combined in this that SAR image, uh, the values, we had values, whole numbers, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I picked uh, the lower integer values, 0, 1, 2, 3, which uh, and I, I believe it was 0, 1, 2, 3, which corresponded on the optical image to be the river, um, some of those wet, muddy areas around the river, and the in, inundated areas in the town. 
So this is a case by case basis. You really have to look at the imagery and look at the SAR and decide what the threshold is yourself. Um, it can be a very specific number, a very specific problem. But um, in my case, it was pixel values three or lower. It could be different depending on a different location or a different set of data you're trying to identify. So really important to actually, um, you know, experiment and try to find that threshold yourself. Just because it works in a flood in Pakistan does not mean the same exact numbers uh, will, will work on a flood in Mexico or, or in the United States. Okay. Um, sorry, there was, that. all right. So another question I have, uh, are there any low code, no code tools available as part of the product for those who are not technically inclined, perhaps a group of filters that can be applied to solve one particular issue. So um, for that, for a low code, no code solution, I would look at a desktop GIS software. So ArcGIS Pro or QGIS. And what you can do, you can use Planetary Computer to download imagery. So you can just download, let's say 10 images, and you can bring it into a, a program like ArcGIS Pro. And once you're in that environment, you do not need to code. Um, there are buttons for everything. There are models, visual models you can write that say, you know, use this tool. And when you're done, use this tool. And when you're done, use this tool. And um, no code needed if you don't want to. And it's very visual. So you'll actually be able to click on the map, click on the data, look at tables, that sort of thing. So um, there is actually a lot you can do. You can do everything I did today with no code um, using those, those software. All right, thank you. Uh, another question here. How easy is it to integrate the Microsoft platform with Anaconda or similar environments to run uh, deep learning stuff? Oh my gosh, it is really easy. That is a great question. So you saw, I, I showed you the Python notebook, which is in Azure in this, you know, kind of browser hub, but you could very easily um, use a local Python environment, Anaconda, you can use a Python environment in Azure. All of those tools work across any Python environment you want. So you are not limited to the notebook. And um, you can actually go a lot further without the notebook because um, if you're doing, if you're in the Python notebook, there are going to be sort of thresholds to uh, compute and space and how much you can download. All of that, you will run into limitations at some point. If you go uh, into your own Python environment locally or on the cloud uh, and just use the libraries that Planetary Computer has written, then you can, you know, you can run any model you want. Uh, at any scale that you can build for. So that's a really good question. If you are technically inclined, if you know Python, all of these tools can be used uh, in your own environment, how you like to use it. And you can, of course, combine it with any other Python code or APIs or projects that you have going on. Very, very powerful. Great. Um, that's great to hear. And let's see. Uh, are all these tools open source? What are the advantages between using the Microsoft platform versus G G E E? I don't know what G E is. I'm not sure what G E E is either, but everything I showed today is open source, with the exception of ArcGIS, which is a desktop software. Uh, there is an open source version version, which is QGIS, um, and yeah, you can always contribute to QGIS and make it better. Of course, um, yeah. So nearly everything was open source. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. There's so many questions, Anna. <laughs> uh, I hope you're not getting too tired of those. Um, no, I love it. Okay, great. Uh, so can this tool use both geospatial images and vector data at the same time for in-depth analysis? Absolutely. There are ways to... Um, so sometimes you have to move between raster and vector representations for some tools to work most optimally. But yes, you can have this data alongside each other and you can um, 
you can basically have them talk to each other. So you can say, give me all of the points that intersect this, uh, this zone in the image, or, you know, give me all of the roads within 100 meters of uh, a value, a pixel of this value. You can do things like that. Sometimes it's easier to do, uh, to compare raster data to raster, vector to vector, but um, it's pretty easy to, to translate between the two. So yes, these tools are pretty flexible uh, with regard to the vector and raster data. Okay, um, I'll take a few more questions. Uh, let's see, is it possible to classify different buildings and areas using different colors to uniquely identify them? Yes, it is, but you will need more information than the image provides. So um, at this resolution, many buildings look kind of the same. So, you know, I can't tell if it's a school or a post office or a hospital, usually, based on the satellite imagery alone. Now, if you had some other data, like you had OpenStreetMap data or um, some other data source that enhanced this information, then you can very easily color them as you wish. You can say, all my hospitals are red, all my schools are blue, this neighborhood is orange, whatever you need. But you need that semantic data because the satellite imagery alone will usually not be able to provide it. How often is the Bing team updating the building footprint? Is it possible to see where buildings disappeared after the flood? That is a great question. Um, I'm not sure how often it's updated. I, I probably not very often. Uh, it's not going to be as frequent as the satellite imagery that we talked about. So um, it's a good starting point if you don't wanna go identify your own buildings. However, um, their methodology is, is open. There are other building footprint methods out there that's very similar to what we showed today. So um, if you wanted to see a building before and after event, I would actually recommend going to Sentinel data, going to Landsat data, and identifying the buildings before and after. That will be far more telling because you can have control over the dates. Unfortunately, with that Bing data, uh, it will not be so, you won't have that same control. Thank you. Uh, what is usually the accuracy percentage when it comes to thresholding based on pixel data? Um, there are a lot of papers out there on this. Uh, I, I don't know specifically, but um, I, don't, I don't know actually as a number. So this is sort of where we get into deep remote sensing science to actually, uh, we would need some ground truth to validate against to really know the accuracy but uh, less than 10%, I would feel comfortable saying that. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, how can a layman learn about data acquisition and data analytics using Python? That's an excellent question. Um, to be honest, all of the information we need to learn about GIS, data analytics, Python, uh, it's all online. I mean, we live in an amazing time where YouTube can teach us these things. Stack Overflow, there are tutorials. Uh, all of those resources are free. I really believe that a lay person can use those resources and become very, very powerful. Uh, you do not need school necessarily. You do not need experience or training necessarily. I believe everything can be learned online. Um, especially with Python. It's one of the most popular languages in the world. Um, so many resources out there. Great, thank you. Uh, have you used ground truth to validate flooding area calculations? So I have not, not in what I showed today. Um, I have done that in the past. So um, this is really the right way to do things, the scientific way to do things. You know, you're going to make a model using imagery, but you want to know how accurate is it really? And that's where you need someone on the ground or maybe drone imagery can be used to do that validation. 
And um, with that, you're actually able to show, to demonstrate and quantify your model, how good it is. So we did not do that today, uh, but that would absolutely make everything far more accurate, far more useful and far, far more scientific and rigorous. So I love the comment, ground truth, validation is absolutely needed if you want to be very precise. I think I'm going to take maybe one more question because uh, we're running out of time <laughs> and it's really been engaging for us already. Uh, would topology data help predicting flood impact downstream, elevation data, elevation level? Oh, yes. So elevation data is, um, we call them DEMs, D digital elevation models. And these show us per pixel on a per pixel basis, what our elevation is above sea level. And this can be very good at um, predicting where flooding could occur in the future because low laying areas are more susceptible to flooding, right? So um, this is absolutely an analysis that's possible. Um, there's a lot of science, a lot of research around this area. The thing is we want a very, very accurate uh, not accurate, but high resolution elevation model in order for this to work. So um, the stuff that's free 30 meter resolution from Landsat uh, is probably not good enough to really get a good analysis there. That is where uh, you need something a little more high, high resolution, which can be expensive um, if we can't find it for free or open source. So the idea is very good, the idea works, but um, but you need good data to really uh, realize it. Yeah, and I think uh, I'll end that here and tie it back to our first thing, the hackathon that we did. Anna was part of uh, the team as well as was Travis. And in that we did use uh, DAM data, digital elevation modeling model data. And the idea was that um, the platform that we saw with, uh, with uh, park floods with floodlight, this is where we're like, okay, how can we add value? If because Pakistan's terrain goes from the highest mountains, you know, down to the ocean, and so terrain is a big part of of, of the flood impact, and so showing that in a three D uh, environment with elevation, uh, the idea, the hope was that would add a bit more information or value to to for relief or relief prioritization. So uh, this great question, and I think there's a lot more questions coming in. And uh, I really appreciate the engagement. Uh, you know, please feel free to uh, reach out to me at least, uh, and I'd be happy to kind of, uh, if there are other questions that I, that I can try to, uh, you know, maybe reach out to Anna. We have Travis as well on the call. Uh, uh, these I've shared the LinkedIn's both Anna's, Travis's, and myself. Um, so if there's things that you need to reach out about, uh, about questions on any of these topics, please feel free. And with that, thank you so much, uh, Ali, in particular, uh, for hosting this event for us in such a such a short amount of time, such a quick time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate uh, everyone that was able to make it. And for those that weren't able to make it, this session had been recorded, and so we can share that out as well. Uh, again, thank you very much, Anna, for for this amazing presentation. Thank you all for your engagement. I'm very humbled to to meet you and get to talk about this with you all. So thank you so much for for joining, especially those of you who are in Pakistan, where it is uh, 10 p.m. now. Thank you again. All right. Thanks a lot. See you, everyone.